been here a long time. Just this ghostly presence now. Holding the stories of this house for the longest time. little thing but not fit for hard labour pointless putting you in the kitchen Major Mahan's first words to me innocent face a trusting face words I'd heard before he wasn't all bad but there's them that swore he was rotten to the core. And back then I was one of them. But when a spirit is left lingering in a house like this, your thoughts collect in different ways. Listening to the echoey voices whose words still hang in these very walls. still feel the roughness of his hands as they cupped my face. Sweet and innocent, he said, as his face shadowed mine. I was sure he was going to kiss me. <laughs> Andy Connor, that is, but not his lordship. He was an old man in his sixties and not like that at all. Not like some of the landlords at the time. Andy Connor. Sweet and innocent. Perfect for the job in hand you will be, our eyes and ears. His hair was black, like wet turf, and his eyes were dark and broody. I would have done anything for him. Well, I wasn't here long when the monster himself visited. Who shall I say is calling? John Ross Mahan. On what business, sir? I am his land agent and cousin, you stupid girl, he said as he swept me out of the way and went straight into the drawing room. I crept round and stood just here. No, it's out of the question, John. I won't do it. For God's sake, you don't have any choice. The March census shows 11,958 people on your 11,000 acre estate. One person per acre, Dennis. It's not sustainable. It's that simple. Some of them have to go. The most economic way is to ship them across the Atlantic. What about the local poorhouse? The figures are here in black and white. Look at the damn report. You've had it for a week now. Damn well you know it makes sense. Cost of keeping a pauper family in Roscommon poorhouse, two shillings and ninepence per week. So let's say they're there for a year till the potato crop comes in, and that's if it does cost per annum seven pounds three shillings. And it's cheaper to send them to Canada? Cost of passage to Quebec averages three pounds twelve shillings. That's half the cost. Look here. The cost of clearing the surplus population would be five thousand eight hundred and sixty five pounds twelve shillings. And they are gone for good. Putting them in the poorhouse would cost eleven thousand six hundred and thirty four pounds ten shillings. Oh dear God. Damnation on the day I inherited this place. It's a poison chalice. The Canadian ships are our only option, and at least they get a chance of a new life there. But they are not passenger ships. They are cargo ships. They can't cater for humans. You are already £30,000 in debt. You can hardly afford passenger ships for these wretched creatures. It's because they are coming from Canada with timber, normally they go back empty. 
they can use the people as ballast. That's why it's so cost-effective. Everybody wins. The ship companies are happy. Your tenants get a chance of a new life away from this rotting land. And you get your estate back to profitability. What the hell is wrong with you? But Quebec... The taxes in New York are higher. And anyway, there are better opportunities for work there. No point in wasting money unnecessarily. The Canadians are a sympathetic race. Bishop Power was horrified with what he encountered here. Reports are that on his return to Canada, he has set up assistance for the Irish immigrants. Oh, I don't know. I'll make it simple for you, will I? You ask for a viability plan, this is it. Your only sensible option. Damn, the banks will foreclose on you. Do you not understand? If you haven't got a neck for it, if those ships don't sail for Canada with our cargo, you can find someone else for my position to sort out this mess you're in. Andy was delighted with that bit of information. Not that I saw myself. Too dangerous, he said, to be seen together, now that I was his eyes and ears. I used to think this place was haunted. Never thought I'd end up haunting it myself. Oh, well, the stories these walls could tell. The Molly Maguire's Secret Society. Daft name, really. Endless means. Talking with the hatred burning in their eyes, right through to their souls. Funny thing, hatred. Plotting and planning. All hush hush. All secret meetings at the foot of Schlieg Ball Mountain yonder. But everybody knew. Well, the Major was hated by many. Even the parish priest hated him, Father MacDermott. Oh. Now he was one terrifying man if you got on the wrong side of him. Himself and his lordship fell out. Fell out big time. His lordship had been away in London, hobnobbed, and the first relief committee meeting he was at, after his return, they nearly came to blows. Imagine it. The priest and the landlord throttling each other. Something about figures. His lordship questioned the priest. One Father MacDonald didn't like it one bit. Johnny Mac did a great interpretation of the priest. I can still hear his booming voice ringing in my ears. Like being at mass. How dare you! Come here to tyrannise over me. How dare you come at the eleventh hour after leaving me to do all the work and attack me with your sidewind illusions. I have a hand to defend myself and I will do so. You who have amused yourself burning houses and turning out the people to starve. It is no wonder he was annoyed. With his lordship in London, well, we couldn't count the dead nor dying in Strokestown that summer of 47. And most of them ones that had been crowbarred out of their own grotty huts. And the meeting ended in disarray, and Father MacDermott stormed out. It was in this library, at this very desk, that I heard his lordship write to Father MacDermott. Heard, because he always read his letters aloud. Always. Me? I was hiding behind this curtain over here. Be my sweet, quiet little mouse, Andy had said. And I was. My heart pumps, and I can still feel the swoosh of blood in my head, even yet when I think of him. I really believed I was going to marry him. So, here I was, 
quiet as a mouse, waiting for the next bit of information to pass on to him. <clears throat> 8th of September, 1847. Sir, the very unwarranted language which you made use of towards me on Saturday 28th of August at the meeting of the Relief Committee in the presence of Dr. Shanley and others and further, if I am rightly informed, repeated again by you at your chapel the following Sunday. In justice to my own feelings and as a landlord over a numerous tenantry, I feel doubly called upon to request you will give me an opportunity of replying to these very serious charges. As I understand, the Relief Committee are to meet on Friday next. I request that you will come prepared to prove them, as I am determined to lay the matter before the Committee on that day and submit to them how far you were warranted in making such charges against me. Hmm... Bridget, where are you? I want this letter taken to Father MacDermott immediately. The row was the talk of the town, of every townland. Major Mahon was livid when he received Father MacDermott's reply. I heard it, verbatim, from Johnny Mac. Sir, until you make atonement to my feelings as a clergyman, for your insolent and personal attacks, I shall attend no meeting where you are present, either publicly or privately. I make this reply to convince you that I am only anxious to avoid a person whose conduct seems so extraordinary and who seems to disregard the ordinary forms of civil society. My calling does not allow me to resent the insults I receive, and therefore common prudence, as well as religion, point out to me the necessity of withdrawing myself from the society of persons who may be inclined to offend me. No mention of his stern evicted tenants there, or the battle lines were drawn. Me? I was getting tired. I had been here two months short of a year, and I hadn't seen Andy in all that time. I penned me on metal. Oh yes, I could read and write. Wouldn't have been much of a spy if I couldn't. But my letters were all of love, not hatred. My heart ached to see Andy. I had heard the rumours that he and the money were wires were organising to have Major Man, or some said John Ross Man, shot. The ship, the Virginius, never reached Canada. The people were enraged with the Major, presumed it had been unseaworthy and had sank. Well, rumours were rife in June and July that they were trying to find an assassin who could get nobody to do it. Whoever did it would hang for sure. For murder is always murder in the eyes of God. I was terrified Andy would do it himself. 